Hello everybody, it's Dr. Galvin with a coronavirus update. Today is Tuesday, August 4th. And sorry, the update's a little bit late today. Uh, I normally try to do it on Mondays, but we moved my daughter, who's a senior at Appalachian State, back up to her house yesterday. And so I was busy and could not do it. You know, lots of stuff going on. Some interesting news about treatments. Um, to start things off, if you don't know who I am, my name is Jeffrey Galvin. I'm a board certified emergency medicine physician and also run a functional medicine clinic in Charlotte. I take care of coronavirus patients in the emergency department and now more frequently, I'm, or more and more commonly, I'm taking care of our patients who have developed coronavirus here at the clinic. The goal of this, this broadcast really is to try to provide some even response to some of the, the hype out there about the virus. I try to give people the facts as I see them as a practicing physician and try to not bring a lot of politics and other things into it. If you find these things uh, valuable, please subscribe to us on YouTube, follow us on Facebook. As usual, we're gonna start with the numbers, 18.3 million cases worldwide, 692,000 deaths here in the US, 4.8 million cases, we're up to 158,000 deaths this year from COVID-19. In my state of North Carolina, 128,000 cases, 2,010 deaths, we've crossed the 2,000 death mark. Um, there's some news on treatment. Um, one, there's been some updates, the Novavax, Nova, Novavax vaccine had some promising uh, results published, and so that's another one of the many different vaccines that are being developed for uh, vaccine candidates that are being developed for the virus. More importantly though, Eli Lilly has come up with an antibody treatment. It's, it comes with a very sexy name of ly Cove 555 I think their marketing people are gonna need to get a hold of that name before it goes anywhere. But basically, it's an antibody, and the thought is if we can use antibodies external antibodies against the virus, we can get good results. And so those, they've got two trials going on, active two and active three. Their active two is looking at nursing home patients that have got mild to moderate symptoms but are not admitted to the hospital and they're going to be getting, uh, there's 220 volunteers that are going to be enrolled in this trial. It's a randomly controlled trial and I'm gonna talk about that a little bit at the end, what those that means, but basically half the people will get the treatment, half won't, and they'll look at the, and compare the results. Uh, active three is a second trial utilizing hospitalized patients also that have mild to moderate symptoms that have had symptoms for less than 13 days. And again, that one is gonna enroll a thousand patients. And again, they're gonna be randomized to either treatment or control. And they're gonna follow standard of care otherwise. So things like remdesivir, um, hydroxy, uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, methylprednisolone, the IV steroids that we're using, um, any required antibiotics, anything that would be standard of care uh, during that hospital stays, they'll get that. The only additional thing will be the antibody. So again, when you randomly control these things, you want both groups to be the same. So you, you treat them exactly the same except for the intervention. The, the next thing I want to talk about is this, you know, what looks like is becoming a second wave of cases in Australia. They did a pretty good job down there of, of knocking out the first wave. They thought a lot of the first cases came from travelers coming into the country. You know, now it's winter time down there. And we've been worried about a second wave heading during the winter. And what they're seeing now is a, is a big spike in cases. And in Melbourne in particular, they have really instituted some very draconian lockdown protocols for six weeks. And, and that means like you're stuck in your house, you only one person can leave for a day per day. You can't leave. You can't go more than three miles from your house. I mean, it's very, very strict. Um, the The planners in Australia feel that they need seventy percent of the population following the basic public health guidelines: masking, social distancing, those things, in order to get this under control. Um, and there's a question of whether maybe they're a victim, you know, they're a victim of their own success. They were so successful in tamping it down that almost nobody's been exposed and nobody's got any immunity. And so they're, you know, now they're now it's out in the community, they're seeing community spread. And so maybe they're suffering from that. But the other question is, is it possibly related to, you know, a winter secondary, 
you know, wave. And we might see the same thing here in the West, both in Europe and the US. So Australia is someplace I'm, I'm kind of closely looking at. Back to vaccines briefly, you know, we likely need 60 to 80% of the population to get vaccinated in order to kind of beat this virus. If we don't get that, it's gonna be with us for years and years and years. And there was a Yahoo poll that just came out that says um, that it was done between July 28th and July 30th, that only 42% of Americans are willing to get vaccinated against COVID. So if that's the case, just understand we're gonna be doing this for a long time. Now, people have asked me, would I get vaccinated? Well, first of all, I'm not gonna really have that choice because I'm gonna be forced to get vaccinated because I won't be allowed to step into the hospital if I don't. Now, that being said, um, I really do want to you know, see safety protocols. And until we get this phase three data, I wouldn't get vaccinated now unless I were to volunteer for a trial. But really we need this phase three safety data to really make good, good decisions. Remember, there is not a vaccine. There are multiple vaccines being developed. There, there are different types of vaccines. So to call it a vaccine is really a misnomer. We don't know which one is going to be successful. There may be multiple ones. We don't know, you know, with the protocols that are gonna work. So, you know, I think we need to give, you know, these studies a chance. We need to look at the safety data so that we can make educated choices about vaccines. Because the fact of the matter is if we don't vaccinate, we are going to be dealing with this problem, these lockdowns and everything else for years and years and years. And we're gonna to have to make a decision whether we wanna keep dealing with this and you know, not have an economy, not have a, a life, or are we willing to say, okay, there's reasonable safety data here. And if I get vaccinated, we can get through this a lot faster. And you know, we're gonna to have to have that discussion. The last thing I wanna talk about is, you know, we've talked about the American frontline, uh, America frontline doctors and the hydroxychloroquine. And I really don't wanna get back into hydroxychloroquine, but why is it that we, the doctors keep demanding these randomly controlled trials in order to determine efficacy. It's simple because a lot of the, the studies that purport to show benefit for hydroxychloroquine are really not designed to do so. And so if I have um, you know, 600 patients that I treat with treatment X and two of them die, then I can say that treatment X was 99.5% effective in treating that. Now, is that true? No, it, it's not true. We don't know it's true. The only way to say that it's true is to have a control group that's basically exactly the same as the other group and don't treat that group, and then you compare the two. And if 50 people died in the control group and only two died in the um, treated group, then you've got something. But to do that treatment group without a control group is meaningless. You cannot compare. And especially when we're talking about something like COVID-19, which we know 99% of people are going to recover from. So no matter what we do for the vast majority of people, they're going to get better. And I keep using the M&M analogy. If I give you know 600 people M&Ms and only two of them die, do I have the ability to then say, oh, M&Ms cure COVID? No, of course not. And without a control group, it's really difficult. And so a randomly controlled trial basically takes two groups of similar populations, similar people. One group is the experimental group and they get the treatment. And the other group is the control group and they don't get the treatment. And everything else is sort of left the same. So there's not really any variance. Sometimes those are randomized, meaning, um, or, or usually they're randomized, meaning that we don't know who's gonna get the treatment, who's not, but sometimes they're blinded. And that means that neither the researchers nor the people know whether they're getting the treatment or not because bias can can kind of creep in if, if you know, you know if, the, if the people who are conducting the study know who's getting the treatment, who's not. Oh, my buddy's in the treatment, I wanna make sure that he gets it. These little biases can sneak in. So if you blind the study, nobody knows, and that's a better way to do it. So a blinded randomly controlled trial, and then basically that intervention is really the only real difference between the groups. And then you run the trial for a period of time, and then you compare. And that's the only, that's the gold standard. That's really the only way to link observation. Oh, we had a better response in this group than this group to causation. Well, the only difference between these two groups was this group got X. And X might be some drug, it might be dexamethasone, it might be you know something else. 
but that's really the only way we can show benefit. And so when doctors harp about these randomly controlled trials, it, it's, it's, important, it's an important distinction. When randomly controlled trials show no differences, that's powerful information. And what we're dealing with with hydroxychloroquine right now is many randomly controlled trials that haven't shown any benefit. And the only studies that you know, purport to show benefit are really not controlled, they're anecdotal. Oh, this guy treated a bunch of people with no control group, how do you know? And so that's where the frustration is. And I understand, we'd love to have a treatment. And if tomorrow three randomly controlled trials come out and say, you know, hydroxychloroquine used in this combination with these things, whatever works, then, you know, I'll prescribe it. But until I have that, you know, there's no proof that it does anything. And so again, that's why we demand randomly controlled trials, not only for hydroxychloroquine, but for remdesivir and for, for this antibody therapy that we talked about, you know, ly Cove 555 all those things, it's important. I'm gonna end it there. Please, everybody, stay safe. Wash your hands, wear your masks, look after yourselves, look after your family, look after those around you. If we do those things, We'll get the virus under control. We'll make our way through this. Have a great night, and I'll talk to you later in the week.